Good morning. Good morning. This morning's scripture reading is in Ephesians chapter 1, verse 15 to 23. For this reason, I too, having heard of the faith in the Lord Jesus, which exists among you and your love for all the saints, do not cease giving thanks for you while making mention of you in my prayers, that the God of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of glory, may give to you a spirit of wisdom and of revelation and the knowledge of him. I pray that the eyes of your heart may be enlightened so that you will know what is the hope of his calling, what are the riches of the glory of his inheritance in the saints, and what is the surpassing greatness of his power toward us who believe. The, these are in accordance with the working of the strength of his might, and, and which he brought about in Christ when he raised him from the dead and seated him at his right hand in the heavenly places, far above all in authority and power and dominion, and every name that is named, not only in this age, but also in the one to come. And he put all things in subjection under his feet and gave him as head over all things to the church, which is his body, the fullness of him who fills all in all. This morning, I'd like to speak to you about the exalted Christ. As we have walked through this epistle of the Ephesians in chapter 1, we've seen many great and glorious things. We have seen how great is the salvation in which we find ourselves. If you are in Christ today, it is because you were chosen by God himself before he created anything. Do you understand this? Do you realize that if you are born again, it is because in eternity past, God knew you by name and had already chosen you, selected you, and separated you out to be his own purchased possession. Do you further understand that the purpose for your salvation is that you are to be holy and blameless before God, and that to accomplish his purpose, he had to sacrifice his own beloved son in order to clothe you with his robes of righteousness. Do you realize that if you are in Christ today, it is because you have been predestined by God to be partakers of eternal life. And that when he saved you, he adopted you into his own family, that you are now sons and daughters of God. And that one day he will come and take you to your forever home in the heavenlies, where forever and ever you will be granted the privilege of worshiping your king in perfect, unbroken fellowship. These are just some of the riches which belong to all who are in Christ Jesus. He redeemed us from the curse of the law, having been made a curse himself in order to pay the otherwise unpayable debt that we owed to God for our wickedness and our rebellion against him. He purchased us with the price of his own beloved son's blood, in which is the only acceptable payment for without the shedding of blood, there is no remission of sins. But the price was paid. Because when you were dead in your transgressions and the uncircumcision of your flesh, he made you alive together with him, 
having forgiven you all of your transgressions, having canceled out the certificate of debt consisting of decrees against us, which was hostile to us, and he has taken it out of the way, having nailed it to the cross. And because of this, there is therefore now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. For the law of the Spirit of life in Christ Jesus has set you free from the law of sin and death. For what the law could not do, weak as it was through the flesh, God did, sending His own Son in the likeness of sinful flesh, and as an offering for sin, He condemned sin in the flesh, so that the requirement of the law may be fulfilled in us who do not walk according to the flesh, but according to the Spirit. Indeed, We have been granted the gift of the indwelling of the Holy Spirit, who is the pledge, the seal of our inheritance. Now, seals used to be placed on property to indicate ownership. But more than that, they were used to guarantee the correctness of the contents. The fact that we were sealed with the Holy Spirit indicates that we are owned by God. It is a declaration by God himself that we are indeed his own purchased possession. God himself has given us this pledge, this deposit, which is itself the guarantee that the full amount will be paid, that what what he has said he will do. So the Holy Spirit living within the true believer in Christ is proof that he belongs to God. And what is our inheritance? It is God himself. It is his dear son. And it is the Holy Spirit. It is an eternal home in heaven where righteousness dwells. So wonderful, so marvelous, so glorious was the thought of this blessed Inheritance that Paul begins his letter to the Ephesians with the doxology of say, a, a praise, saying, Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us with every spiritual blessing in the heavenlies in Christ Jesus. And Paul wasn't the only one. For Peter also launched into a doxology of his own in his first epistle, saying, Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who according to his great mercy has caused us to be born again to a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead to obtain an inheritance which is imperishable and undefiled and will not fade away, reserved in heaven for you who are protected by the power of God through faith for a salvation ready to be revealed in the last time. And all of these blessings have been bestowed upon us in order that we would be to the praise of His glory. We who are in Christ are truly most blessed among men, for we have been visited by God Himself and have been made His own purchased possession. Our position in Christ is impregnable. For Jesus himself said, My sheep hear my voice, and I know them, and they follow me, and I give eternal life to them, and they will never perish. And no one will snatch them out of my hand. My Father who has given them to me is greater than all, and no one is able to snatch them out of my Father's hand, and I and the Father are one. Our eternal souls are safe and secure in the arms of of the Good Shepherd, and while men here on earth may kill our bodies, they cannot touch our souls. Such glorious truth is too high for us. The psalmist said we cannot attain to it. Such truth moved the hymn writer, Edward Mote, to pen these words, My hope is built on nothing less than Jesus' blood and righteousness. I dare not trust the sweetest frame, but wholly lean on Jesus' name. On Christ the solid rock I stand. All other ground is sinking sand. All other ground is sinking sand. 
the same magnificent truth moved Horatio Spafford in the midst of horrific, the horrific loss of his daughters in a shipwreck to declare through song, it is well with my soul. After declaring all of these great and precious truths to the members of the Ephesian church, Paul did what any faithful pastor would do for his flock. He prayed for them. This man who had taught them for the space of three years, now in prison, had received news of their continued faithfulness in the truth of the Word of God. And this moved him to rejoice in the Lord. And hearing this, he, based on the clear evidence of their living faith, declared that he had been praying for them ceaselessly and giving thanks for them ever since he heard this good news. Indeed, what could lift the heart of a man of God more than to hear that those among whom he had ministered were continuing in the faith, growing and maturing and living out their faith to the glory of God. But notice Paul does not merely sit back content with their current state of spirituality. He longs to see them grow even more and more, and he prays to that end. And if you will turn to Ephesians chapter 1, and we'll pick up at verse 17, you will hear his prayer and the requests that he makes on behalf of this flock. And I would dare say these, this same prayer is made on behalf of us who belong to him. Ephesians chapter 1, beginning at verse 17. Paul prays that the God of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of glory, may give you a spirit of wisdom and of revelation in the knowledge of Him. Now let me ask you a question. What is the greatest knowledge one can have? It is the knowledge of God. So important is this, that Arthur Pink wrote a book on the attributes of God so that we might grow in our, our understanding of who he is. A.W. Tozer wrote a book called The Knowledge of the Holy, dealing with the same subject. And more recently, Paul Washer produced a, work, a workbook titled kn Knowing the Living God. And in a classic book on the attributes of God, J.I. Packer does a bit of catechetical training so that we, and we would do well to give heed. Listen carefully to these, to these questions and answers. He says this, What were we made for? Answer, to know God. What aim should we set ourselves for in life? Answer, to know God. What is the eternal light that Jesus gives? Knowledge of God. Did he not say, this is eternal life, that they may know you, the only true God, and Jesus Christ, whom you have sent? What is the greatest purpose in life, bringing more joy, delight, and contentment than anything else? Answer, the knowledge of God. Jeremiah the prophet says, Thus says the Lord, Let not a wise man boast in his wisdom, let not the mighty man boast in his might. Let not the rich man boast of his riches. But let him who boasts boast of this, that he understands and knows me, that I am the Lord who exercises loving kindness and justice and righteousness on the earth where I delight in these things, declares the Lord. So what of all the conditions God ever sees man in gives him the most pleasure? It is when they have the knowledge of himself. This is why the Westminster Catechism begins with this question. What is the chief end of man or the main purpose for the existence of man? And the answer is, to our purpose in life is this. We have been created to glorify God and to enjoy him forever. In order to glorify him, you must know him. 
And I'm not speaking of some kind of a general acquaintance. I'm speaking of an intimate knowledge based on a deep study of God's Word and an intimate communion with Him in prayer. And this is what Paul desired when he prayed that the God of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of glory, may give you a spirit of wisdom and of revelation in the knowledge of Him. In Job 22, 21, we read these words, Acquaint now yourself with God and be at peace, thereby good will come unto you. But many so-called disciples are content to grope through life without digging into the Word. There are those who say, it's just too hard. It takes too much time. Or, I can't understand it. Which is a telltale sign that you don't know God. Because if you know God, He gives you the Holy Spirit who teaches you all things. And then there's the the really poor excuse. That's what the pastor is for. And then there's my favorite. I'm waiting for the comic book edition. You wonder how anyone could think that it is okay to neglect the Word of God, especially when it is so easy to get your very own copy. As I said, the greatest gift anyone could give to a pastor is the evidence of increasing faith, love for the saints, and an ever-deepening knowledge of God. And so Paul prays that the eyes of the hearts of those beloved Ephesian disciples would be enlightened. Now what does that mean, the eyes of your heart? Does your heart have eyes? The answer, which I heard, is no. But there has been so much nonsense taught for so long that this needs clarification. And where better to go than to Pastor John MacArthur to clarify this for us? He says, quote, Now this introduces to us a very important thought. The word here in the Greek for understanding is the word kardios, from which we get cardiac. The word means heart. Literally, the Greek says the eyes of your heart may be, enlight- may be enlightened. And this is interesting. The source of spiritual enlightenment enlightenment is God. We know that from verses 15 through 17 because Paul is praying to God. He knows that God is the source of this understanding. The channel of that understanding to us is the Holy Spirit. The object or purpose is the knowledge of God. Paul is saying, God, give them the knowledge of yourself. And now, here is that organ of that understanding. The source of truth is God, the channel is the Holy Spirit, and the object is that we may know Him, and the organ of it is the heart. It is the heart that must have understanding. So now we've got a problem. We have a problem with this term, so I have to explain it to you, because for us the heart means, well first of all it means this organ in our chest, which does not think. It beats, it pumps blood into your body, but it does not think. Most of the time people refer to the heart as your emotions. American culture has so designated the heart to refer to the emotions. All of our love songs are about the heart. And we pass out little hearts on Valentine's Day. Everyone is giving heart, their hearts to one another. And it's supposed to convey the love that we feel. But that's not the way the ancient people, uh, the Hebrews... And the Greeks understood this, and this is not the way the Jews approached it at all. I'm going to show you. The Jews spoke about feelings not in terms of the heart, but by using the term splachnon, the Greek word which means bowels. This puts a different twist on the subject, doesn't it? We don't think of that word today. We don't say to your wife, I love you with all of my bowels. There there would be something definitely missing in such a designation. But that's precisely the way the Hebrews would have spoken, and that's why the word appears so very frequently in the Bible. Why? Because the Hebrews always associated the feelings, feelings with his organs right in the stomach. We say things like, I've got a gut feeling. When you're nervous, you get an upset stomach. You get pain or anxiety there. You feel things there. You don't feel things in your heart unless you're having a heart attack. 
<clears throat> you feel them in your bowels. And so and the Hebrews saw things that way. And the heart, you see, to the Hebrews did not mean the feelings. It spoke more of thinking. And that's why the word cardias can be translated either heart or understanding. As a man thinks in his heart, so is he. Out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaks. The heart th then speaks of the thinking process. The heart of a man is deceitful and desperately wicked. Who can know it? Uh, it is <clears throat> it's the thinking, it is the will, the thinking and the understanding part that is true throughout all those scriptures. So Paul, for, Paul's first request in Ephesians 1 is that they would be granted a deeper knowledge of God that the eyes of their hearts, that is their understanding, their minds would be enlightened to know these glorious truths. He's talking about the understanding or the thinking processes and he prays, oh God, open their minds to be able to know these things, end quote. Furthermore, Paul re requests of the Ephesians that the eyes of your understanding will be enlightened so that you may know what is the hope or the confident assurance that belongs to all believers of his calling. What are the, rich, the, what are the riches of the glory of his inheritance? We already looked at that. And what is the surpassing greatness of his power towards us who believe? So Paul's second request is that the Lord would give the Ephesian believers understanding of his great power which will bring them to their inheritance and glory. The same power that raised Christ from the dead is the power that resurrected us from spiritual death, that granted us new life in Christ and that keeps us secure in His omnipotent hand. It is the same power that raised Christ from the dead. And Paul, Paul's request is that they would know these things. That is, what is the surpassing greatness of His power towards us who believe, these are in accordance with the working of the strength of his might, which he brought about in Christ when he raised him from the dead and seated him at the, his right hand in the heavenly places. God seated Christ at his right hand in the heavenlies. Being seated speaks of a, the completion of work. He sat down having completed all of his work. The right hand is the place of honor. Christ's work is a completed work. There is nothing left for him to do. His salvation is a complete salvation. It is finished, he said. In Hebrews 10, the writer compares the human priest or contrasts the human priests with our great high priest when he says every priest stands daily ministering and offering time after time the same sacrifices which can never take away sins. But he, Christ, having offered one sacrifice for sins for all time, sat down at the right hand of God, waiting from that time onward until his enemies be made a footstool for his feet. For by one offering, he has perfected for all time those who are being sanctified. And so we see Christ seated at the right hand of God, his work finished and he is waiting for the day when he will return and the kingdoms of this world will become the kingdoms of our Lord and of his Christ and he shall reign forever and ever. Amen. In the meantime, we see that Christ has been exalted far above all rule and authority and power and dominion and every name that is named, not only in this age but also in the age to come. This is what the scripture means. The scriptures mean when they speak of Jesus Christ as the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords. He rules in the affairs of men. He appoints kings and he deposes them. And he says things like, See now that I, even I, am He, and there is no God besides me. It is I who put to death and give life. I have wounded, and it is I who heal. And there is no one who can deliver from my hand. 
He says, Indeed, I lift up my hand to heaven and say, As I live forever, if I sharpen my flashing sword and my hand takes hold of justice, I will render vengeance on my adversaries and I will repay those who hate me. I will make my arrows drunk with blood and my sword will devour flesh with the blood of the slain and of the captives from the long-haired leaders of the enemy. Or Psalm 50, verse 22. Now consider this, you that forget God, lest I tear you in pieces and there be none to deliver. Or these words from Isaiah 43. Even from eternity I am He, and there is no one who can deliver out of my hand. I act, and who can reverse it? It's a rhetorical question. The answer is no one. It is Christ who rules and reigns over His creation even today when there is so much that seems out of control. Wickedness is exalted in high places, but it is God who has orchestrated everything that is unfolding before our eyes. Some would say, that's not fair, that's not right, or my God is a God of love and He would never have anything to do with such things. To this To these objections, I would say God has made everything for its own purpose, even the wicked for the day of evil. And as for the wicked rulers, Solomon says, the king's heart is like channels of water in the hands of the Lord. He turns it wherever he wishes. Like Pharaoh of old, God has raised up these men in order that he might show forth his glory in them. Consider, too, that the Scriptures declare that when a people rebel against God and pursue wickedness, He gives them over to judgment. And what we see in our country, and indeed around the world, is an open rebellion against the revealed truth of the Word of God and His judgment is being revealed from heaven. The kings of the earth, the psalmist says, take their stand. And rulers take counsel together against the Lord and declare and against his anointed, saying, Let us tear their fetters apart and cast away their cords from us. So what does the king of kings do in response to this? Well, first of all, he who sits in the heavens laughs. And then we read, The Lord scoffs at them. And then he will speak to them in his anger and terrify them. In his fury, saying, As for me, I have installed my king upon Zion, my holy mountain. To him, the nations are as a drop in the bucket. They are like grasshoppers in his sight and are less than nothing. He rules and reigns supreme over all of his creation, and there is no creature hidden from his sight. But all things are open and naked before him with whom we have to do. This is the king spoken of in verse 21 of Ephesians 1. He is far above all rule and authority and power and dominion in every name that is named, not only in this age, but also in the one to come. This Christ, this Christ is the one who orders all things after the counsel of his own will, he is moving all things into the culmination of the age when he returns to put an end to rebellion. And he is the one who saved us and who keeps us and will bring us who belong to him to glory. And Paul's request is that the Lord would give believers an understanding of the greatness of his person. For he is the one who secures them and empowers them in the face of all, all the turmoil of the world. We see Jesus strolling above the waves, ruling and controlling all things by his omnipotent power. When we understand this vital truth, then the words of Christ to his disciples will come for us, comfort us as well as he says, Take courage, it is I. Do not be afraid. And why should we not be afraid? Because the King of kings and the Lord of lords overrules all things according to His sovereign good pleasure. And this sovereign Lord has promised never to leave us nor forsake us. He promised to be with us even to the end of the age. 
And he promised to take us home to be with him forever. The enemy may kill our bodies, but after that, they have nothing more they can do to us. And we know that to be absent from the body is to be present with the Lord. Look at verse 22 of Ephesians chapter 1. And listen to this amazing declaration. And he, that is God, put all things in subjection under Christ's feet and gave him as head over all things to the church, which is his body, the fullness of him who fills all in all. That's, a, that's indeed a mouthful. Well, let's take it one point at a time. The first thing we see is that God has put all things in subjection under Christ's feet. Exactly what does that mean? Well, it speaks of total dominion over his creation. The ancient rulers would step on the necks of vanquished kings, demonstrating their authority and power and showing, showing that their enemies had been completely vanquished. This was called the subjugation ceremony. It was the last official act of a formal military surrender whereby the king, the general or leader of a conquered army, was forced to lie prostrate on the ground with his head bent far enough forward so that the foot of the conquering king, general or leader, could be placed in the center of his neck. This act proclaimed publicly that the enemy had been overthrown and that his army had been rendered powerless. The custom of subjugation was practiced extensively among the ancient people. And it was seen in the book of Joshua where Israel performed this ritual as well. Jo Joshua or commanded the victorious generals to put their feet on the necks of the conquered Amorite kings after which these kings had been put to death. So it will be with Christ. The king of all kings and the Lord of all lords will one day put an end to this wicked world. And as I've already stated, on that day the kingdoms of this world will become the kingdom of our Lord and of his Christ, and he shall reign forever and ever. Of his kingdom there will be no end. And finally, we see that God also gave Christ as head over all things to the church, which is his body, the fullness of him who fills all in all. This Christ overrules he who he overrules all of his creation by the word of his power and he is the head of the church the ecclesia the assembly of the called out ones we are those who have been personally handpicked by god called out of the world by god to come to his son for salvation we who belong to christ are examples of the power of god to save sinners to resurrect the dead to deliver the slaves of the devil, transform them and make them his own beloved children. And as the head of the church, he is our ruler, our master, and we are his subjects. As the head of the church, he is worthy of all worship. And that's why we're here today. We have come to do homage to the Son because we love him who first loved us. And we have come to declare our utter dependence upon him for all things, knowing that he loves us and cares for us as a shepherd cares for his sheep, and knowing that he has promised to supply all our needs to, according to the riches of his glory, which are in Christ Jesus. The point of all these petitions, then, is that we might comprehend how secure we are in Christ, and how unwavering and immutable is our hope of eternal inheritance. And how glorious and exalted is our King. We are subjects of the exalted Christ. And as such, we are safe in the arms of God who promised never to leave us nor forsake us. Such thoughts moved Paul to declare, for I am confident of this very thing. That he who began a good work in you will perfect it until the day of Jesus Christ, to the praise of his glory. Let's pray. Father God, I do praise and thank you for your majesty. We have seen you in these scriptures high and lifted up and exalted far above everything. You are God. 
You rule over everything. There's nothing outside of your control. You are God. And you are our God. And we worship you because you are our God. I pray in Jesus' name you will take these glorious truths from your word and drive them deep into our hearts. Cause us not only to hear, but cause us to obey, demonstrate our faith in you by our deeds. I pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.